What's up, gangsters? It's a sunny day at Rube Goldberg Enterprises, and time for one of my favorite kinds of videos, a finished project. Uh, this is one that I've been working on uh, quite a bit recently. It's been a, uh, a little bit of a departure um, for me. Um, obviously, if you've watched much of my nonsense, you know I have kind of a schizophrenic modeling personality, and I just go for stuff that I think is cool. Um, I definitely don't stick to a single genre. And I have been trying to improve my figure painting skills for a long time. And uh, my buddy Carlos Starton suggested that doing a bust would be a really good way to work on that. And so, um, I got myself the Young Miniatures uh, one-tenth scale U.S. Army Air Force fighter pilot bust because I thought, hey, um, this one is one that I can kind of relate to and I think it's pretty cool and it seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Famous last words. Um, huh. I don't think I could have made a much worse choice for my first one-tenth scale bust because this thing was a challenge. I thought it would take maybe a couple of weeks, <laughs> try more like six, and um, obviously I didn't work on it constantly for that whole period of time, but uh, it was a pretty steady effort, um, and I did learn a lot. Um, it, it was honestly uh, one of the most uh, enriching experiences that, that I've had uh, recently. A, a lot of stuff packed into a relatively small project. Um, all about the painting, but also about working with resin, because these kits are resin kits. Um, and this one is, I, I, I mean, I, I don't have a lot to go on as far as how good resin kits are supposed to be. I mean, I've done exactly two of them so far. My uh, uh, Industria Mechanica Cosmonaut number 2 that I finished earlier this year, and my Futuristic Robots Stan robot, um, are all I really have is a frame of reference for how resin kits are supposed to be. This is the first hand sculpted uh, bust that I've done, or, or any resin thing at all, because the other two were, were uh, uh, modeled in CAD and then 3D printed. So this, uh, you know, uh, was a little bit of a different experience. Um, I, I did not uh, do the normal two-part build review thing with this one because it just it only had like 20 pieces and uh, I was pretty much done building it before I even could evaluate kind of how I, I thought the kit was going to go so I decided to just go ahead and uh, finish it, do the painting, do all of it and then do a single episode. So before I get into talking about the details of, of the kit and how it went Let's take a look at the results.
Okay, so there you go. That's what I managed to pull off. Um, there definitely is some stuff to talk about with regards to building and painting this thing. Um, I've, but I'll tell you right up front, uh, if, if you are hoping that I'm going to give you a recipe for how to paint uh, figures, <laughs> yeah, uh, I need to learn how first. <laughs> Um, then maybe I can, 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 can give people some tips, but seriously, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty stoked with the way this came out, but it is far from great. Um, I, I have a lot to learn yet, a lot, lots to practice, um, and I have no business telling anybody how they should do this, but I will tell you what I did. Um, but, uh, first, um, uh, let me tell you about the kit. Um, as I said, this thing is a, is a hand sculpt, and it's pretty amazing to me that somebody can sculpt something like this, you know, by hand and from, from their mind. I mean, that's a level of talent I'll never have. Um, and this one's pretty cool. It's inspired from a photograph that's pretty well known of a young uh, fighter pilot, uh, Lieutenant Richard Vernon, I think was his name. Um, and uh, you can find that photograph easily on the interwebs. Um, as well as photographs of all of these pieces of gear like the May West and the oxygen mask and all that kind of stuff for good color references. Um, I spent a lot of time looking for good pictures because I didn't want to just paint the exact colors on the box art. Um, I liked the style on the box pretty well. I mean, it's obviously beautiful and better than what I would do, but a little more like, I don't know, melodramatic than what I wanted. Um, I... Um, you know, I like it, but again, uh, it's it's pretty melodramatic, and he's added in a lot of detail that's not actually in the in the in the in the actual casting, like those stitches on the goggle frame, for example, and the texture on some of the straps. So, anyway, um, well, I'm getting off track here, um, but what I did find with the with the fact that it's hand sculpted is that there were certain things like the eyeballs that uh, were not as crisp as this, as like my um, uh, figure from Industria Mechanica where it was 3D printed. And that would have helped me do a better job of painting the eyes. Um, I, I basically was just happy to get out of it, you know, without hopefully him looking cross-eyed or, or too stupid. I kind of got one uh, iris nailed uh, and the other one a little off, but... Ah, uh, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I, I, I did, I did, did. I, it's my first time to try some eyeballs like this, so I was happy to even do that good. But uh, there are parts of it where the molding is is just not as crisp as um, as it might appear from from a distance. But hey, it is what it is. I mean, I guess that's the deal with these uh, hand sculpted resin things, and you just you either can work with it or you can't. So you got to man up and 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 improve your skills. Pattison. Yes, talking to myself. Anyway, um, so uh, the other thing that was really challenging with this um, was um, the uh, was fitting all of these hoses and and and, and wires and, and cables and so forth. Um, the thing basically came in two huge chunks, which was his head and his body. The, uh, the parachute pack was already molded on, the, uh, the goggles, everything, all that stuff. So that, that was just two big chunks. And then you had to go ahead and add things like the ripcord uh, cable, the oxygen mask, the straps, and so forth. And <laughs> this was a super non-linear modeling construction problem uh, because... Not only do you get absolutely no instructions whatsoever, and, and I, you know, normally would be a little annoyed by that, but I don't really know how they would help, um, other than one thing, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, but you basically have a single view on the box of what the thing is supposed to look like. I mean, there's not even any, you know, pictures on the side other than other busts that they offer. Which I thought they could have done better with that. I mean, for what you pay, you should at least get some more views. Fortunately, I was able to find multiple views of the actual box art uh, piece on the web, and that gave me some references for how to orient the oxygen mask and, and all of that stuff. 
But my first challenge was that all of these wires uh, and the uh, rip cord were are, are are cast as straight resin pieces, so you have to bend them. And I had never done that before. I had no idea. Why I had no clue how to do that. Um, and I had heard you know about people doing it with hot water, and so I tried it uh, by heating some water really hot and must tap you know from the tap that. I have right close by that is way too hot to put your hand under, and I immediately snapped this ripcord thing in half. So <laughs> uh, that was a fail, and obviously not the right temperature. So I, I boiled some water and tried it again, and what became clear to me is that the glass transition temperature, and for you non-engine nerds, uh, glass transition temperature is when a material goes from uh, being elastic to plastic, meaning it will take a permanent deformation. Like polystyrene melts at about 420, but the glass transition temperature is about 200 degrees Fahrenheit lower. And so uh, what I found is that the glass transition temperature for this stuff that enables it to flop around like a noodle, and it does get super soft, is... <laughs> Somewhere below boiling, but somewhere above the 140 degree temperature that is generally considered the maximum for human touch. So I don't know, 180, 170, 190, I don't know. But what was really clear is that as soon as the water cooled off below that point, nothing was going to happen. You could leave the piece in there all day and it wouldn't bend even a little bit. But as soon as you went above that temperature, yeah, like wet spaghetti. And uh, so that made shaping these pieces a lot easier once I figured that out. But it still was a challenge. I mean, you know, you had to, I had to do some visualization and some, you know, it was, it was bend a little here, check fit, bend a little there, check fit. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the way that I got these things to, to drape. I think they look pretty natural and the curves are smooth. Now, somebody on SMCG very rightly said, dude, why don't you just do those with lead wire? And I could have, and, and the result might have been better, but um, it would have, in a, in a way, it would have been more work because I would have had to fabricate these connectors. Um, and lead wire is very soft. So these, once shaped, are stiff and will hold their shape as long as you don't break them somehow through all of your subsequent handling. And lead wire doesn't necessarily do that. And it's a constant effort of, I have found of shaping it and then constantly tweaking it and reshaping it and fixing it as you go through the process of installing it. So in a way, I kind of feel like that these resin things were were better. They were a little easier. Now, what was not easy at all was the uh, straps for the oxygen mask. Um, and I'm... Uh, so I was grabbing something off my bench that I thought would kind of show this, but it's not what I thought it was. Um, anyway, the, um, the, the, the oxygen mask straps, you can see, are not only very small, um, but they also were straight. And you have to not only position the oxygen mask relative to the helmet, and I have it drilled and pinned. There's a little steel pin underneath the mask to, to hold it in the right spot. But then you've got to bend and twist these straps to get them in the right orientation to connect from the mask to the snaps on his helmet. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't happening. I tried. Believe me, I tried. Not happening. So what I ended up doing, which I felt super clever for, was taking a roll of my Izu masking tape that just happened to be the exact right width for this and I cut through enough thickness of the roll to basically match the thickness of of the resin straps come on camera focus up there and then roll and then peeled it off the roll and that gave me a strip of extra thick masking tape come on focus there we go gave me a strip of extra thick masking tape that was the right width and that was, of course, totally flexible. So I added a tail. You can see it under there. Um, added a snap. Well, I, I checked the length first. What I did was 
I glued one end of it to the mask, and then just almost too easily, using tweezers, I folded it over until it uh, hit the right spot on the helmet, marked it, cut it to length, added a little snap, and then glued it in place, and um, and then coated the whole thing in super glue to make sure that it would stay, uh, that it would retain its shape and not like peel or or anything like that. And I'm really happy with the way that turned out and with how much easier I solved that problem than uh, with trying to mess with those little resin things because that just wasn't going to happen. The back strap there, I just left it loose like he's unsnapped it and it's hanging there. I just, yeah, whatever. I think it looks natural, so it's all good. Uh, the other thing that was kind of cool, uh, or challenging, I guess, or weird, or whatever, I don't know, some people don't like this floating hand, as I found out in uh, posting photos on SMCG, uh, but it's part of the it's part of the deal, and, and part of the photograph, and I like the fact that he's got these notes written on the back of it, but uh, that gets into the painting part. So, um, to go through that, uh, basically what I did, this is oils over acrylics. And um, the, uh, I started out by doing a technique that I see a lot of these war game guys do, where I primed it in black, and then I painted it, I primed it again from a, a very straight overhead angle um, with, with, with white. And that basically mapped all the highlights and the, and the shadows. And I thought that would show through when I painted the acrylics, which for that I used Mission Models acrylics, because I have found in the past that those are relatively translucent and they'll show up, um, uh, you know, if there's something underneath that has a lot of contrast. Well, it didn't really work, and that whole zenithal hot priming thing proved to be kind of a waste of time, because the colors were all very solid. But hey, no big deal. I just carried on. Um, once I had all of the base colors in place, and for my flesh based, I used basically just, it was a blend of Tamiya Deck Tan and um, maybe Tamiya Desert, I don't remember what it was. Anyway, it, all you need is something that's approximately flesh colored. And given that I wanted him to be kind of tan and, and you know, uh, pilot-y looking, is that a word, pilot-y? Anyway, I might have could have used a redder shade, but, you know, like I said, this was my first one. And what I specifically did not want to do was end up with the real brick red, high contrast look that a lot of figure painters use, which, you know, that's their style and that's cool, but it's not what I want. I wanted something a little bit more natural, but I also wanted tones that were a little bit more, uh, like I said, tan and, and uh, brown, rather. That was the color palette that I wanted. And so, you know, there's, look, there's about 7 billion shades of skin on this planet. And so you can argue all day long that a particular shade you paint is either right or wrong, and it's just silly, because as long as it doesn't look unrealistic, it's right. And I like what I, what I ended up with. Um, it, it, I, hopefully, in the real photos, it shows the right white balance and... Uh, you can see the the actual skin tones, but but I like it. Um, I, I, I achieved a level of contrast that I felt brought some drama, but but not too much, and that's with respect to the whole thing. So basically, the oil portion of all the painting was just using uh, I have Windsor Newton oils, a little bit of Abtilung 502 for certain uh, that I've just bought for certain things like their greens are, are really good. I have a bunch of those. They have some nice browns that I use sometimes and they're handy because they're pre-mixed. But with all of my flesh tones, I just mixed by hand. Uh, and I started out, I bought this book and I'll show you guys this. Uh, I was assured that this book was gonna be the magic recipe. And it was 10 bucks, so no big deal. And it helped me get some kind of, you know, kind of kind of get started, but it didn't really, I mean, it certainly was not a magic bullet uh, because um, this was the color palette that I was working off of. And I found that, yeah, pretty much none of what I mixed, according to this, 
And they tell you one part this, two parts that, three parts the other. They didn't look anything like these pictures when I mixed them. So I just went back to doing it by eye. I also thought that this diagram of the mapping would help, but it's honestly pretty vague. I mean, when you look at it, there's a bunch of places on, on this map where you are not at all clear what uh, shades to mix out of this list right here. So I just was right back to kind of winging it, but I did kind of develop a consistent recipe of of uh, raw sienna, white, alizarin crimson, uh, and uh, raw umber that I used for all of my skin tones from light to dark. And uh, I feel like pretty happy with it. Um, his hand is a little more tan because that seems natural to me. His fingers are a little lighter because of the way the light falls. Uh, but also that seems natural. So I feel, you know, fairly okay about the way that that came out. One thing that I did definitely learn from Carlos is the use of linseed oil. Um, oil paints are, are pretty soft out of the tube, obviously, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to blend the way that you want them to. And blend is, has become a little bit of a confusing word as I've, as I've gone along because when you talk to Mike Rinaldi or read his books, he talks about oil paint blending. And with weathering, that's a little bit different. Um, you want to leach the oils out on a piece of cardboard so that they dry faster and, and flatter. Um, and a lot of what he calls blending takes place with a wet brush that you've you know got a little bit of mineral spirits in. Figure painting is different. Blending is now a matter of blending tones, like when you go from uh, highlights to mid-tones to shadows on, on something like the face, or like the, uh, the wrinkles and the worn areas on the jacket. And Carlos assured me uh, that for that sort of thing, that you go the opposite direction that you want oils that are smoother and creamier, and actually sometimes you need to add linseed oil to them. So I bought a little jar of Windsor Newton linseed oil, and he was right. I mean, of course, look, I've learned one thing about Carlos Starton. Whatever he says, just do that. <laughs> um, there's multiple ways to do things, but you will not go wrong if you just do what Carlos says. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I... He, the dude has been doing this for 30 plus years and he is an incredible model maker and, and I've never had anything he told me uh, go wrong. We disagree on testing paint on spoons, but hey, you know, hey, nobody can be perfect, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I, so again, it was just a matter of having a palette with my basic oil colors out and just blending and blending and blending, again, a different way of using the word, I should say mixing and mixing and mixing on the palette until I had a range of tones that I felt happy with. And then I just started working the highlights and the lowlights with that. Um, and I found that the linseed oil helped me uh, with that, but I didn't use it as much for the, the overall shading. I didn't really need to. I, I was able to get the paint to work the way I wanted it to without it for the most part. But where the linseed oil really helped me a lot was in the detail painting. Getting a consistency that was a lot like uh, Carlos says melted butter and I was like, well, what do you mean by melted? Do you mean like pour it on your popcorn or do you mean like spread it on your toast? And he was kind of like spread it on your toast. But what I found is that pour it on your popcorn worked really good for getting very tiny amounts of paint on the tip of a very tiny brush. And I mean my Winsor Newton Series 7 Triple Ot, which I also found the benefits of working with the little tiny hook that you may or may not be able to see on the tip of it. I mean, I'm talking the specks of paint smaller than a flea. That's what I was working with when I did the eyeballs. Just, I mean, a speck of paint that I could barely even see with my Optivisor on. And using the linseed oil gave the paint the consistency at about that popcorn butter uh, thickness 
to where I could just very lightly paint little, little tiny lines. Like for example, where I painted this circle um, around the hose attachment on the light on, on his life vest, his Mae West. Doing things like outlining on straps like this where you want to paint a real skinny dark line. Um, the linseed oil really, really helped with that and, and I was able to paint um, really small lines. Um, I painted even a little bit of a burn line around the uh, the tip of his cigarette. You can see where I was able to do that with a little shading there. And so listen, if a dork like me that's super clumsy can pull off something like that by using a little bit of linseed oil and a real tiny brush, then there's hope for all of us. Um, uh, it, it definitely opened up a lot of of uh of opportunities for me i feel like in terms of detail painting made me feel pretty powerful i i had, you know i was like man i can't believe i'm actually pulling this off in any way shape or form that that looks okay so um if, if you've you know uh, look i know a lot of people want to want to paint figures with acrylics and that's great uh, those guys can do that that's cool it's one way of doing it um, but for me, the oil paint thing makes more sense. It's more intuitive to just blend these colors by eye than it is to try and remember like Sunny Skin Tone 936 and English Uniform 942. I, you know, I just can't keep track of those, of, of all those lists of colors that, uh, you know, like the guys do who use Vallejo model color. So anyway, I like this. I feel like this was a, a good... Uh, stepping stone for my progress in figure painting and hopefully the next one will be uh, will be uh, at least as good as this uh, and hopefully uh, you guys uh, you know sort of find my journey through this um, helpful for your own figure painting efforts okay so there you go uh, for better or worse my first uh, one-tenth bust and it won't be my last I I, I was um, a little I guess freaked out by uh, how much more difficult it was than I expected it to be um, but that's good because I kind of feel like maybe it'll go <laughs> downhill from here hopefully not downhill in terms of results um, but I like these things they are definitely good training for painting uh, little tiny things like eyeballs not inexpensive I think uh, this one was I don't know maybe 60 bucks or something I can't remember, but I got it from a, a place in the United States. Uh, I found it on eBay from a hobby shop in Kansas City, I think, or somewhere in Oklahoma. Uh, anyway, the reason I bring that up is because there are people who are ripping off these high-end uh, resin uh, producers. Um, I, I've seen some posted on Facebook. And it was obvious that it was a Chinese copy, uh, nothing against the Chinese, but look, they don't view intellectual property the way that uh, we do in the West. Um, and I don't know that the quality is the same. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. But the bottom line is that the money should accrue to the artists and the producers uh, who make these things. Um, stealing intellectual property is just not cool and nobody should support that. So. Take your time, make sure it's the real thing, make sure it comes in this super cool box, and uh, if you want to practice your own figure painting skills, then uh, while I wouldn't necessarily recommend this kit for your first throw, uh, I do definitely recommend these one-tenth scale busts. There are tons of cool subjects out there, and you can I feel certain you can find one that, uh, that will interest you. So. As always, I hope you found this useful and informative, and I appreciate you watching. Much love.